Hi everyone, I'm Rosemary Miller here with Janet Novak, the Washington DC Bureau Chief and Assistant Managing Editor here at Forbes. Thank you so much for joining me, Janet. Thank you. Janet, so what has been the overwhelming response in Washington about the Silicon Valley bank collapse? I would say it's been a mixture of cautious, we're not quite sure what, where this is going, and kind of predictable sniping and knee-jerk um, attacks. So, for example, um, you have some Democrats blaming some of this on a 2018 uh, relaxation of regulation, which uh, was promoted by the Trump administration and the Republicans, but was also supported by some centrist Democrats. And you have um, a lot of Republicans, well, you have kind of three different strains of commentary from Republicans. You have the G, the regulators weren't doing their job, but let's wait and see what happened, which is a lot like what you're hearing from many Democrats. You have the Republicans who are saying, well, problem with this bank is it was too woke. It spent too much time worrying about diversity and uh, ESG investing, and, and, and that's just silliness, complete silliness. And then you have some Republicans saying, well, this is all uh, Biden's fault because this is all caused by interest rates going up and interest rates had to go up because Biden caused inflation. Now, if you step back and you say, look, Biden did pass a very large stimulus, perhaps too large um, in his first year of the presidency. However, most of the inflation is really related to COVID and supply chain and then to the war at Ukraine, Russia's invasion of Ukraine. So you could argue with a straight face that Biden's actions may have exacerbated inflation, but he did not cause it. It's a worldwide phenomenon. So is there... So, you know, it's, it's, very, it's very predictable and very, in some ways, superficial. And the truth is that the serious people are saying, we got to figure out what went on here but probably it was a mixture of mismanagement um, at the bank, and perhaps somebody there is liable for that mismanagement, and some regulators not being doing everything they needed to. So is there a world where Republicans and Democrats can agree on how to resolve this situation? In Congress, no. Mm. I just can't imagine it. You know, um, I think... I think that serious uh, people are supporting on both sides of the aisle are supporting what the administration has done, which is an attempt to staunch uh, the bleeding and make sure there's not a run on more banks and that there doesn't have to be a taxpayer bailout. But let's go back to 2008 when Congress did get involved and things were much more drastic than there really was a widespread. Uh, systemic failure of the biggest financial institutions. And President Bush proposed a, uh, a very big plan, which actually ended up not costing the government anything, but it looked like it was going to cost the government a lot. And it was seen as a bailout to the bankers. And um, he proposed this TARP. It went down in the House. It was defeated in the House because so many Republicans voted against it. The majority of Democrats supported it. The market went down 8% in a day. And um, in the Senate, the Republicans and Democrats got together and they made some modifications and they got it through um, the Senate. And then, you know, with all these different forces, the kind of grown-ups, you would say, coming together, Bush, Obama, McCain, it, it passed finally with increased Democratic support and more Republican support, though not a majority there. And it passed the House and we got this rescue. And it turned out, frankly, to be a success. The government made money on that rescue. But in terms of our politics, it was actually a failure. Why do I say that? Because the reaction to 
that bailout and the fact that, for example, homeowners weren't being bailed out the way the banks were, created its populist surge on both the left and the right. So on the left, we had Occupy Wall Street, where you had these millennials sleeping down near Wall Street and camping out. Um, and on the right, you had the Tea Party movement. And um, the, the legacy of the 28 financial crisis and bailout is that our politics are more populist and basically farther apart than they were in 2008. So should we need another government congressionally authorized bailout? We're gonna have a big problem. And one of the key things to understand about the way the government handled this bailout is that some of the things that they did are best explained by um, they by their desire to act within their existing powers. They did not want to go to Congress and say, give us more power. They consulted with people in Congress, but they didn't want to have to ask for more power. So for example, there were certain things they could not do until they determined that there was a systemic risk. Once they determined there was a systemic risk, then they could bail out all of the depositors, not only those who had insurance. But until they determined that, they couldn't, for example, um, offer to give bailout money in excess of the insurance money to a buyer of um, Silicon Valley Bank. So they were, there were all these different things at play, not just what is the best way to resolve this, but what is the best way to resolve this without calling it a bailout, because that is um, the third rail. We don't want to call it a bailout. So we want to make sure all the stockholders of the bank and the bondholders are, are hurt. And without asking Cong Congress to agree to something. Janet, I want to go back a little bit. Are you saying one of the only reasons we made it through the 2008 financial crisis is because is because politicians on both sides, it was a bipartisan effort to, to push this. Or is that what you're saying? Yes, absolutely. So, absolutely. And in, you also said there's no world where we see Republicans and Democrats coming together on this matter in 2023. Well, I can see the Senate. If, if it got to the point where Congress had to get involved, I can see the Senate doing a deal. I don't know how something passes the House. It could pass the House with mostly Democratic votes, perhaps, but does that even get brought up in this current House? I don't think so. I mean, I, I don't want to find out um, as somebody who has, you know, a 401k and cares about the finances of our country. I don't want to find out. And I don't think the federal regulators want to find out either. Wow. So this is a larger problem. The, the lack of bipartisan efforts in this country could crumble our system, essentially. Yeah, well, they almost did in 2008. I mean, I remember distinctly, I was not on the Hill, but I was watching on C-SPAN when the um, talk rescue, the, the rescue went down originally, and you could just see the markets crashing, 8% in a day. And it was like, well, okay, there was some speculation back then that they needed that. They needed the um, the negative vote and then a crash to bring enough Republicans along to say, yeah, we'll give you enough votes. Um, and, and it was very different leadership. Um, John Boehner in the House, who was trying to do the responsible thing. He's kind of the old line, you know, Wall Street Republican, if you will. So... Yeah, and, and you had a Republican president. Well, if you if you recall, in the early days of the COVID-19 crisis, we got cooperation because you had a Republican president who wanted to do something, which was spend a lot of money. And no surprise, Democrats were happy to go along and spend a lot of money and give people, individuals, and businesses a lot of money. And, and it was, you know, you could argue that some of it wasn't well-structured, and some of it was, you know, an opening for fraud, but it was needed 
They did it. They got together and did it. I don't know how you get the Republican House to go along with a plan that comes out of the Biden administration. In fact, if we get through this crisis, our next crisis is the debt ceiling. I don't know how they get through that one. Could you elaborate on that, the debt ceiling? Okay, the debt ceiling is, um, we, we Congress agrees and the, to spend money, they spend the money, but they spend more than we're taking in. So we have a national debt and we have this bizarre thing called a ceiling, which is, says, here's how much you can borrow. And we've essentially, we have officially hit it. We can't borrow anymore, but the treasury has all these little games they can play to um, extend the life of the debt ceiling. And they take these measures and that should take us to about summer. At that point, we hit the debt ceiling hard, we hit it hard, and we have to have the ceiling raised. And uh, of course, the Democrats are saying, well, we've already spent this money. A lot of it we spent during the Trump administration, either in the form of COVID relief or tax cuts, mostly for rich people and corporations. We've spent the money, we have to pay our bills. We have to, and Republicans are saying, we're not gonna raise the debt ceiling even though they did it three times when Trump was in office, unless you agreed to massive, massive uh, budget cut. So it, it is a, another crisis in the making that's coming on, gonna come on the heels of the banking crisis, assuming we get through the banking crisis. Assuming we get through it, wow. So, so I'm sorry, I don't mean to, to be <laughs> such a Debbie Downer. But. I understand, Janet, but I want to switch gears a little bit, and I want to talk about how the depositors are essentially getting the bailout. They don't want to call it the bailout um, from the SVB collapse, and it's from the FDIC insurance. Um, what is that? Because I know when I open a bank account, maybe I'm not rich enough, I don't think about being FDIC insured. Yeah, but you are FDIC insured, and in fact, um, that's a Federal Deposit Insurance Corp. And you do care about it because let's say you decide that you want to use one of the new digital banks like Chime or something like that. Um, they are actually not technically banks, so they're not insured, but they could not exist if they didn't, in fact, hold your money at a real bank that has insurance. So... I can't imagine why anyone would want to hold money in a bank account, anyone of modest means that wasn't insured. Now, the way that the insurance works, um, this goes all back to the bank runs and FDR in the 1930s. And originally there was 2,500, I believe, of insurance per account. Now the limit is 250,000 of insurance Per account, but that is deceptive because you can actually get a lot more than that. And there are several ways you can get more than that. Either you can spread your money over several banks and get two hundred and fifty thousand at each bank. And nowadays there are loads of ways to do that. You can do that through a an insured bank fund. The, at Fidelity, at Vanguard. Um, in fact, some of the fintechs will spread your money to more than one bank so that you get a million of insurance or more. And the other way to get more than 250,000 is that 250 limit applies to a per person per type of account. Now, your savings, your Checking, they're all one type in the sense that you own them individually. But another type of account is a joint account that you might have with your husband or your wife. And still another type of account is an IRA you might hold at a bank. Now, keep in mind, this is only for bank type assets. If you have an IRA at the bank and it's invested in stocks, it is not covered by federal deposit insurance. But let's assume all your assets are in CDs and 
uh, certificates of deposit, in money markets, and in true bank products. So you, as I said, one type of account is your individual account. One is a joint account where you get another 250,000. And still another is an IRA. So in theory, at one bank, you and your spouse could each get 250,000 in your individual accounts. You could get 500,000 because that's 250,000 each in a joint account. And you could each have another 250,000 in a bank IRA. So we're already up to one and a half million. Then if you have a child and you put money in trust for that child, that is still another type of account that gets you another helping of insurance. Have many children and put, put different accounts in trust for different children, you get more helpings. So if we should be so lucky as to have a lot of money, and you know, there are people who, who may be sitting on a on more than 250,000. They've sold a home. They want to buy another one. Or they're going to retire soon and they're they're not eager to put new money in the stock market and they want to have a lot of cash. There are normal people who might have more than 250,000 and they should be aware of that limit. Now, what we saw in Silicon Valley Bank is that all of the deposits were covered even though Silicon Valley Bank had like 94% of its money was not insured because it had mostly bigger bank accounts for businesses. And um, it was only because they called it a systemic risk that they covered it all. So here's the question that I've been thinking a lot about. What happens if a small bank in a red state is failing? And it's got 10 billion in assets. There's not a systemic risk, or it's hard to see how there's one. What if they don't cover the uninsured deposits? Politically, that would just be a nightmare. So legally, they have not extended um, insurance to all deposits because they use this special systemic risk provision. But in practice, they have. So perhaps the only thing I could see go maybe at some point going through Congress is something that tries to equalize and, and treat maybe, you know, um, all depositors, even the those who have more than 250 as insured. I don't know. But politically, I just don't see what you do. Um, I, I, you have to find a way to cover those people too, because wait, you just bailed out these venture capitalists and these startups who have all this money from um, Silicon Valley and you covered all their money. Well, what about the guy who, who's a main street small business and he has 500,000 in a business account at a local bank the reason he keeps all his money at the local bank is because he feels, A, connected to that bank, and B, he gets better service <clears throat> by keeping all his money in one place. You know, he gets, they, they treat him better, they give him loans, they don't charge him as much in fees. So he has what the banks aspire to have and business people aspire to have, which is a relationship with that bank. In fact, um, we just had a story uh, on where the money was going and were people moving assets uh, because of Silicon Valley Bank. And we quoted a business person as saying, well, he had more than 250,000 with his bank because he got better treatment. And he believes that when, if you recall the government bailout during COVID, there were these loans called uh, PPP loans that were forgivable. They were essentially um, stipends to businesses to keep workers on. And at first, the supply of PPP was running out. And there were great complaints that banks were taking their best customers and moving them to the front of the line. And this guy said, well, you know, I think my bank got me the PPP money fast because I have all this money with them. 
and I have a relationship with them. So there's a reason why a man on uh, or woman who owns a business in a small town might have more than 250000 in a bank. And if that little bank fails and we don't cover them, that, that could be a political mess. Oh, wow. Simply because of that human element being treated better at my local bank, that's why I have more money in this account. Interesting. Well, Janet. Being treated, being treated better, perhaps getting a higher interest rate, um, just convenience. I mean, there was a lot of uh, sneering that, well, these people out in Silicon Valley, they're startups and they're sophisticated, but they aren't necessarily sophisticated about money management. So if you're a big company, you have a treasurer who moves your money around, make sure your cash is getting, is earning, is getting interest. Uh, but if you're a startup and you have 15 million in the bank, cause that's the amount you raised and you're really smart when it comes to the latest that you developed, you don't, you don't have enough money or you haven't considered hiring a treasurer who's going to do that for you. And your venture capitalist who back you says, Silicon Valley Bank, that's where you go. They'll treat you right. They'll give you mortgages for yourself. They'll give you, you know, they'll handle you right. So you go there. So I, I am not, um, I mean, I'm not sympathetic to the managers of Silicon Valley Bank. They made a lot of mistakes. And while it was a difficult interest rate environment, they made big mistakes and they took risks they shouldn't have. But, you know, some of these startups, why should they know that Silicon Valley Bank was playing fast and loose? What do you mean, why, why should, should they, they know? know? That? What do you mean by that? Why should they know? Well, because as you just said, you put money in a bank and you don't even check whether it's got FDIC insurance. You kind of assume it does. And, and if you're running a, a startup, you know you're taking risks. Your risk, the risk is your product will fail. The risk is somebody else will have a, the same idea and do better at it, right? You, but you don't consider putting money in the bank as one of those risks. And you don't look at the balance sheet of the bank. And it's not until somebody starts whispering or your VC calls you and says, I know we told you to use Silicon Valley Bank, but get your money out now, fast. So what happened is that Silicon Valley Bank had, I believe, $212 billion in assets, and it had about uh, um, oh, $100 billion in deposits, 94% uninsured. It lost in one day, in the day before it was closed, $42 billion of those deposits. That is that is a run on the bank. And it was a run on the bank precipitated by how fast money can move now, right? We you don't have to go to the bank and line up if you have another place account you can move it to. You can often do that online. And it was also precipitated by the fact that instead of acting independently, all these Silicon Valley bank customers were kind of acting as a herd. They were all getting similar messages from their funders, get your money out. So I don't think a bank that didn't have this very concentrated clientele is quite as susceptible to a run. But they had they had all these factors that made them susceptible to a run. <laughs> Excuse me. They mismanaged their interest rate risk. They handled they handled it poorly. Um, it doesn't look like their advisor, Goldman Sachs, did a great job on handling it. And so they announced on what, last Wednesday, they announced that they'd sold uh, 21 billion in treasuries and taken this loss and that they were raising more capital. Well, normally you'd prefer to raise the capital and have it lined up before you would announce you had this loss, but it didn't work out that way. And that precipitated the run. And the run was faster than anything anyone really anticipated because of both Twitter and private communications between influential people and, and venture capitalists in uh, Silicon Valley, uh, including 
founders fund that told their their companies to get out of Silicon Valley Bank. So, you know, it, it, it there was this incredible brew at Silicon Valley Bank of most of those deposits were uninsured, which is not typical of most banks. Um, it had a concentrated business in the sense that it was mostly, it, they had wineries, but mostly they had startups. And they had done some very poor asset management. So they, if we want to go back, they get this law passed that says you can get it, you can get up to 250 billion and not have this extra regulation. And then coincidentally, the tech market starts booming. We have all this VC funding coming in. So they grow from uh, under 50 billion at the end of 2017 to 212 billion at the end of 2022. They could not lend out this money or fast enough. They couldn't do that. What they did was they put a lot of it into long maturity treasuries. And the, part of this was enabled by accounting convention, which says that uh, if you're holding a safe, uh, if you're holding to maturity a government bond or something that's equivalent, you don't have to market to market, which means when interest rates started rising, they did not have to show on their balance sheet that the value of those bonds was falling. The reason the value of the bonds was falling is because they carried lower interest rates than the interest rates available today, now that the Fed has been raising rates, okay? So they put off dealing with this problem. They did not hedge their risk. And then when their, their clientele started withdrawing money, because as we all know, funding for startups has been uh, declining and companies are using up their, their bank accounts and rather than go out and get another funding round, well, they didn't really have the, the liquid cash to, to pay those depositors. So that is why they had to sell these long dated treasuries at a loss. Let me give you an analogy. If you were, if you were, you had, you were investing for retirement on one hand and you're saving for a down payment for a house on the other or you're saving for your kid's college next year on the other, or you're saving for your retirement next year on the other, the money you're gonna need in the next year or two, you should be keeping very liquid, right? So, you, so everybody tells you, don't look at your 401k, invest for the long-term, that's retirement. Well, your retirement is, in your case, 45 years away, and that's good advice. But if you're saving for a down payment that you're going to want to buy a house next year, you don't want that money going up and down. You want to keep it liquid. This is what pension funds do. They say, when are our people retiring? We need to match the maturity of the what we've invested in, right, with our, our liabilities to pay people. So they have in very short term uh, investments the money to pay people who are going to retire next year, right? So if you needed money immediately, you would keep it somewhere liquid, right? You keep that in your checking account or money market account, which is a good idea, you know, because you want to make some interest now. But you're not going to tap your, we hope, your 401k. That's your long-term money, right? So we, what we fundamentally had in Silicon Valley is they mismanaged their um interest rate risk, they had all this long-term money, and that meant they had to sell the bonds at a loss. But until the day they sold them, the accounting let them pretend that the bonds were worth 100 cents on the dollar because of the fact that if they held the bonds to maturity, they would get 100 cents on the dollar, right? You buy, you buy a government bond, it comes due in 10 years, for $1,000, you get that $1,000. The problem is that if you bought that bond five years ago, it's paying very little interest compared to what you could get today. So if you have to sell that bond, 
that isn't paying great interest. Nobody's going to buy it for a hundred cents on the dollar. Right. Does that make any sense? It makes a lot of so sense. They I had, mean, they had all these um, de depositors who were really short term in their thinking. We got to get our money. And they had the money squirreled away in a long-term bond that they couldn't sell for a hundred cents on the dollar. So they had to sell some bonds, 20 billion, take big losses. And that created the crisis of confidence in the bank, the loss of confidence in the bank, which set off just a lightning speed run on the bank, which forced the uh, regulators to say, this is a systemic risk we need to guarantee all the deposits or they will all leave. Thank you so much, Janet.